We're back. Okay, we're back. Mm -hmm. And uh, this time... Yeah, yeah, we wanted to talk about critics. Mm -hmm. Um, For the simple reason that, I'll tell you the truth, I don't think critics have much influence anymore. Uh, There was a time uh, during the 60s and maybe into the 70s where critics were almost as important to the cinematic event as directors were. And that's where you got celebrity critics like um, Pauline Kael. Yeah. I mean, she wrote best-selling books. Andrew Serres. Film criticism. Andrew Serres. People like that. We don't see that anymore. Uh-huh. You know. Uh, yeah, some critics publish books, but then were not bestsellers, which means they don't get to the larger public. Um, they are the film fans and aficionados buy the books, and that justifies their being published. But um, books, you. I mean, the New Yorker magazine, for instance. Their subscription increased because they had Pauline Kael right, right for yeah. them. She's um, like a star critic. Right, that's what I said. Yeah. yeah, like that. And so I thought we'd talk a little bit about the critics we have now. And I made a list of the ones that I found interesting. Well, real quick, let me uh, let me yeah, talk ahead. about that. Touch on that real quick. Is that uh, I think that the last of those really mm-hmm. the death of that period is uh, Roger Ebert mm-hmm. and what I mean he, he, he lasted beyond that period right. but he was right. the last one critic mm-hmm. who was a household name right. like almost right. everyone yes. knew Siskel and Ebert mm-hmm. and after Siskel passed they knew Roger Ebert and the whole idea of two thumbs up right. was something that was you know you saw that and that that meant something to the general public. Right. Nowadays, right. Totally they right. don't. I don't think they care who no. it says underneath the quote. You know, that's on the DVD cover. So anyway, there's a quick thought that I thought Roger Ebert was really the last of those. And one of the problems they critics have had is that the larger newspapers have been paying for them. You know, they don't want to spend the money. Right. Uh, they phased out the important ones like Hoberman at mm-hmm. The Voice. Yes. Uh, and the others. The Times maintains like four of them. And some of them have developed at least a name for anybody who reads that. You know, but that's about it. Uh, probably the most influential um, base, critic base now is Rotten Tomatoes. Right. You know? Which is just a collection yeah, of critics. Yeah, I know. Critics. I yeah. know. Um, it was funny because, you know, that little nine-year-old fellow that I said I yeah. hang with, uh, we were going with his dad to a movie um, a couple of weeks ago, and he went on his dad's phone, and he came up, and he ran right up to the box office, and he said, Dad, you can't go to this movie. <laughs> and his father said, why? He said, because Rotten Tomatoes only gave it 24%. That's great. And that was it, and we had to change movies. That's and hilarious. So he actually reads that That's one. That's so funny. You know, like this. But um, I know you like Hoberman, so why don't we start with him as a critic? Yeah, I uh, with some insight. Yeah, yeah, you know, I used to check out the Village Voice website every week, mm-hmm. and I started to notice this name underneath right. most of the reviews, and I thought this guy is actually writing some real stuff about cinema. It's mm-hmm. not just the typical what I see most these days is just this like overpraise or this bashing of films. He's actually saying something perceptive about film. He's coming at it from an interesting angle, even when he's wrong. I remember when he wrote about The Hurt Locker, and you and I talked about this, he was comparing it to, like, that she's she's exploring professionalism um, in, in the military, the way that uh, Hawks, mm-hmm. you know, so he's, right, yeah. he's talking about those things in a very informed way. Um, even when he's wrong. So I thought he was great, and what's very very interesting is that, you know, right after they they let him go at the Village Voice, I mean, the Village Voice's criticism just dropped completely. It's not interesting. I tried to read it. I tried to stick with it. And Hoberman has done some of his own stuff on his website, but really now it seems like he's just kind of doing articles here and there, specialty right. articles. Yes. Yes. And they're always fascinating to read, like the one I yeah, gave yeah, you last right. week about Bresson. Mm-hmm. He, it's just a review of a book, pretty much, two books. But he touches on some, he says some interesting shit in there. So I really like him. And um, to me, he's, he's one of the only people that's worth reading. Yeah, he's a, one of the few remaining critics who I respect. First of all, the critics that, I mean, the ones that I read or see in the, pa- the papers, it seems like their film awareness started with Star Wars. Right. And moved <laughs> forward. Yeah. You know, like that. And so they have no idea of what preceded that. Right. And uh, subsequently, they have no real insight into, you know, any film that's um, they're, they're looking at and making judgments about. The other thing, and we talked about this before, 
is that they seem so bourgeois in their taste, so that anything that's outlaw or moves off of what is coming down the mainstream, I mean, we are talking about Mel Gibson earlier, yeah. um, they don't even want to deal with it, they just dismiss it. Uh, it's almost as if, if it doesn't have a Hollywood budget, you know, which is to say 40 million and up, right. the film isn't worth considering. You know? Well, look at how they treat two very similar films in terms of, of, of the genre and the cast. Hateful Eight, which they give all this right. lip service to, right? And they're almost, a, they're almost to me apologizing for Tarantino's, like, like they're yeah. they're so forgiving of Tarantino's faults when he makes, you know, because he's one of their darlings, mm -hmm. right? He might be edgy, but he's he's bourgeois edgy, mm -hmm. right? And then you have something like Bone Tomahawk, which is mm -hmm. legitimately, you know, inventive, and they just kind of dismiss it. Oh, it's a horror film. It's yeah, kind of yeah, enjoyable. Yeah. It's a horror film, it's right there, yeah. but they're not taking it seriously as a piece of cinema, and I think I think that it is. So, I agree with you about about that and, and where they're coming from. And whenever they embrace a film completely, that's when I really get turned off from seeing it. Oh, me it. too. Me too. You know? I mean, I've I've gotten to that point where uh, most of the critics have become reverse barometers for me. Yeah, you know, if they really like it, I know it's middle class. I know it's um, conventional, and that it lacks. A certain kind of outlaw element right. that I like to see in the work, you know. Well, speaking of this year, mm -hmm. films that got totally like so, La La Land. Yes. we're, we're going to talk about. That's a film that before it got reviews, mm -hmm. I was very excited about the prospects <laughs> of the on paper. You know what I mean? The, the follow up to Whiplash. Mm -hmm. Now I will go see it to have a reference point, but I'm so sick of hearing how beautiful and brilliant it is, right? Manchester by the Sea, same thing uh -huh. for me. I know yeah. you liked it. Oh, we'll it. talk yes. about our, our, our best of the year. I thought it's one of the worst films of the year. <laughs> I really do. And I think that the critics, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, of course you like this film. It's about, it's, it's, it's about as watered down of a drama as you can possibly get. Um, and then something like Silence, though, comes out. And they have mixed feelings on it. Mm -hmm. And the things they're saying, well, I don't know what to make of silence. And I go, shit, man, this actually might be a good movie. <laughs> the critics don't know what to say about it. Yes. So that was that was my main thought about, about that. It's a sad state of criticism when we get to that point where we're skeptical of what they right. have to say in mass. You know? yeah. Because there was a point there where there were some insightful critics. I didn't fully agree with Andrew Saris in what he had to say about films, yeah. uh, but I was interested in what he had to say. Sometimes I learned something from it. The same thing with Pauline Kael, who I thought was very biased in her own way, and sometimes Pauline Kael would give a review, a rave review, and I know that's a movie I will hate, and I won't go to see it, but once she wrote well, that's the other right. thing, but she had insight into the art, the craft of the cinema, and this is something I don't get from the current reviewers that I mm -hmm. read, and I read quite a few of them. So as I said, I made a list of the ones um, that, you do look at. that I look at. Uh, A.O. Scott, he's at the New the York Times. Times. Yeah. Uh, Manola Dargis, she's at the Times as well. Okay. Um, then Hoberman, and he's on Rotten Tomatoes, formerly of the Village Voice. Amy Nicholson, She's on MTV, oh, and she does the LA Weekly. Right. The LA Weekly is the one that I've read. And she has some insight. They all have at least something worthy of attention, yeah. um, my attention anyway. And then there's um, Jonathan Romley of Film Comics. You've read some of okay. his. Yep. Yeah, and then Rex, Rex Reed. Reed. I wanted to <laughs> mention him, and I was laughing about that. I'll get up to the last one and go back to Rex Reed. Okay. There's Nick Davis, and he has a thing online okay. called Nick Davis Daily's Picks. But Rex Reed, I frequently agree with him because we're around the same age. So that's why right. you know, it's a that's senior funny. citizen's perspective. Right, right. But he threw me for a loop this year because he made a list of his, th well, he gave one of the worst reviews, and I mean laughable reviews, where you actually read it and you laugh out loud at what he has to say, because he ostensibly hated the film so much with La La Land. He said, you know, it was awful. He did? Yes, oh, absolutely. Ah, I have to but read But then, he, then he lists his ten best films, and La La Land is in there. Oh, thing. you son of a bitch. And he says, by default. What the in hell other words, that, that there weren't any better. Okay? 
than that. That's, that's so, a crock of shit. Well, to that's me, he jumped I on laughed. the bandwagon. Is that's that why I laughed when you said about La La Land, because I told you, I said, I, I'll mention something about it later, because I couldn't believe this guy had reversed himself. I actually had my wife read the review, and she laughed. And then I said, you won't believe this, a few days later. It's and I showed ten. her, and she, she's as baffled as I am. You know? like <laughs> that's this, really so frustrating. Odd. You know who I like? Hmm. Um, I like Elvis Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I don't know where he reviews anything. I don't either, yeah. but I've been listening to his podcast, right, and I yeah. really like what he has to say, and I like his approach. So he's he's very interesting. Oh, I thought he was one of the better reviewers, really, uh -huh. until the Times cut him off again. You yeah. know, and I didn't understand that. And now he does with eight, um, Turner Classic Movies. Okay. He's on there, and he interviews actors and stuff. And he's a good interview. I mean... Um, you know, insight into their work, their careers, etc. But I haven't seen any reviews by him in a long, long time, and I forgot him really. The only other reviewer. guy that I listen to is Michael Phillips from the mm -hmm. Chicago Tribune. Yeah, I've he's read pretty him. solid. Yeah, he's he's an intro. And I again, I, I'm listening to these guys more now over podcast actually than I am mm -hmm. reading their reviews. But I like what he has to say. So uh, real quick, a thought about Andrew Saris. I like his ambition as a critic mm -hmm. with the whole pantheon, the, the right. putting yes. the, the list yes. of American directors. And that's what's really mis missing that's in critics now, too, is that it's just reviewing movies weekly, maybe occasionally putting out a book. But the book is not, I mean, he's saying, yeah. like, yeah. here is, I'm going to tell you who, I'm going to assess the entire American cinema right now up to this date and I thought that's that's great and, and really we need a critic who's willing to, to, to do to that. work like that now yeah. the books that the critics put out now are just really compilations of their reviews right you yeah, know but you're not getting people who are looking at the art of cinema and suggesting directions it might go into yeah. uh, shining lights in dark corners of the cinema uh, directors who aren't being appreciated, whose work aren't getting the kind of appreciation they deserve. Whether we agree with it or not, right. uh, we need to get critics who do that. And so we don't get, you know, I don't sense the fact that with the critics that I read now, that criticism is um, a passion for them. You know, I think it's something legitimate because, you know, there's always a question as to why do we need critics? I think we do. You know, mm -hmm. in all the arts, um, you need somebody to assess right. the, the value of it, to look back on its history. Right. We need people to husband the art and say, look, you're making bad art, and we need to scold you or spank you for it, <laughs> you know, or flog yeah. you for right. it, you know, in one way or another. And so when I talk about critics, is I just want to see them get better. I want to see them be more committed, you know, to it. One of the problems that I've seen, and this I saw this over the years, is that the people who become critics frequently were just journalists who decided that they watch a lot of movies, so why shouldn't they become yeah. critics? And if that is the criteria, um, we all, I mean, privately we all yeah. critics, you know, that gives us the fact that we go to see the movie, we all have opinions. Well, that's very similar to the the who teaches film at universities. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's like anyone can teach film at universities. Yeah, yeah, They've just seen Star Wars and they can teach film, yes. right? You know. And now it's the same thing with There's critics. There's no criteria. And of course, blogs. It's cool that blogs have come up and people can anyone can write reviews. But of right. course, now it's just flooded with anyone who's got an opinion, and it's, it's hard to weave through and find. And that's the what I'm saying. I mean, everybody has an opinion, but what for a critic, we want some insightful observation into the art. I want to touch on something that is a little bit different when it comes to criticism. Is my personal experience with sure. my work being mm -hmm. being reviewed by critics. And something that I learned, you know, the, the films of ours that have been the most reviewed or the, the film of ours that's been the most reviewed was Durant's Never Closes. Mm -hmm. And I learned an interesting lesson there. I do value critics. I think that they're an important part of, of the film process. But the reviews that we got for that film hurt the film. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what they said about the movie. I found almost every review, even negative, to uh, sort of support what we've done. And I, I enjoyed reading the reviews. It didn't mm -hmm. bother me personally, but because they're collected on Rotten Tomatoes, mm -hmm. 
we have this negative Rotten Tomato, and that shows up almost everywhere the film is sold, mm -hmm. and then therefore people go, oh, 20%, I'm not going to watch it. And I think that happens, what I learned is, okay, so that not only happens to our film, it might happen to a film like Blood Father right. with Mel Gibson, and then people are passing it by. So I don't know really what to say about that, but I wanted to mention it because since then, I've not sought out reviews mm -hmm. because I know that they could help a little bit potentially but they have they do they have more potential to hurt yes. than to help and again i don't care about getting a negative review i think they, i find them very interesting but when it's when there's this category of someone gives you three stars and they rotten tomatoes counts that as as a rotten tomato mm -hmm. right and then your your percentage starts to go down and people are just looking at a wider percentage. I go, what the fuck? They're not even reading the review. Yeah, yeah, They're not yeah. even seeing the quality of the film. There's, oh, no, we don't want to go there. So now, That's I, something I, I never thought about. I yeah. Think, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because it is one of the new inventions of the Internet. Right. You know, uh, you know we never had that before. You yeah. Know, because people, some people read the Times, some people read the Post, but there was never an accumulation yeah. of response I think variety would give it but you'd have to be an industry insider yeah, exactly. to read it you know in variety but now as you say it's available on Rotten Tomatoes and I I'd never thought of that at all and that is true it harms the yeah, film yeah in bigger and films it's yeah. not going to matter no you know because they just ride over it with that publicity if, right if yeah. Rogue One had gotten bad reviews so it would have made just as yeah. much money most likely but with a film like ours, mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I better stay away because I don't know what way the critics are going to go. Yeah, and if yeah. they trash the film, it could really hurt our chances of making money. So yeah, well, it's maybe. just an interesting thing that I've seen. And it becomes a challenge to figure out how to get past that. Right. You know, because that's, you do have to get past that. And it goes back to what we were saying. Uh, beyond the fact that it's hurting the film, we're talking about critics who don't really have much insight anyway. Right. So you're talking about ignorant people. Right. You know, informing others on something they don't know much about. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and you like can't that. even get it. I, you know, I'm not saying that they would have a different take on it, but yeah. I can't get it to the A.O. Scotts or the right. Hobermans yeah. or right. the people yeah. that I actually admire. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's only a couple critics that I feel like are really in tune with the work. And again, that's that snobbery I was talking about, where if the film doesn't have a budget of X amount of millions. Uh, then right. they're not interested. It's like art can't be made yeah. unless you spend, and that's an industry conceit. Right. You know, it's not a fact. Yeah. You know, like this. And if we judged all art by that, we'd have, we wouldn't have much. You know. Yeah. So that's something that bothers me about uh, the criticisms of today. You know, uh, when I taught, I always told students. I mean, you might remember. I don't know. Uh, that to be their own judge. You know, and I always said, you know, the thing that I hope people would take away from the class is not to go to the recent releases, but when I talked about a director that I'd ignite somebody's interest in the work of that particular director, that they want to look past whatever, and right. that they'd have enough of their own opinions about film, that they're not relying on some critic to tell them to go to see this or go to see that. Yeah. You know? like that. I mean, I understand a nine-year-old doing that. Right, right. You know? yeah, but exactly. one would hope by the time he's 19, he won't be looking at Rotten Tomatoes and deciding to go to a movie because of that. But the point you're making earlier about that, that's exactly what happened because he was telling his fault. You can't go. This was a big picture right. you know, that yeah. he did that with. But you can't go to see this because, so he tells us about the influence of Rotten Tomatoes, which, I, as I said, I hadn't considered that. So that's a very, very solid point. Yeah. I really just wish that, and you touched on this a little bit, that critics would emerge who would champion cinema, write about new directions for cinema, and stick with filmmakers. And what I mean by that is not just do this loosey-goosey, I like one film, mm -hmm. I don't like right. the next, yes. I, you know, and Look up the and body down. Of work. But you say, okay, this filmmaker did something interesting. And then their sophomore effort, say, okay, it was a little bit flawed, but we're, we're still following this person and, and, you know, and promoting the trajectory of their career because you got to just go with them. I mean, someone like Scorsese, 
look at the highs and lows, yes. Yes. but you want someone to say, this is an important filmmaker, mm -hmm. and even when they miss, that that review say, look for this in the movie. Look, look at the, you know, look at this that's good. So I wish that we would have critics more like that, and hopefully there's a new wave of critics that emerges. So. Yeah. Well, you know, um, we had that in literature, and I remember um, Somerset Maugham once gave um, what I consider a good analogy for that, because um, there is this mis this missive quality. You come out with a terrific film, and then your second film isn't as good, and suddenly you're dismissed. Right. You know, yeah, you, we made a mistake. This guy is no good, or this woman is no good who made this picture. And Somerset Maugham says, you know, any long career is like a series of mountain peaks, hills, and valleys. He says, you have a peak here, you go down, you have a hill, you go down into the valley, you right. come back up, etc. And that goes to what you were saying about critics looking over a body of work or encouraging mm -hmm. interesting filmmakers in their, you know, maiden efforts, right. you know, like that, saying, you know, it wasn't a perfect film, but he touched on this, or she had certain things that, if developed, might work into, you know, being terrific for the medium, right. you know. When I was teaching again, um, I had students who worked for the State Press, which was the uh, ASU's um, newspaper, mm -hmm. and they did reviews, and they very eagerly bought me, I think they gave me a dozen reviews, a bunch of them had written. And I went and I read them, and when I came back, the only thing I could say to them, I said, you know, one thing, you should, all the reviews showed me how clever you can be and how funny you can be at the expense of the work. And their justification was, you know, they, I remember the one guy said to me, so other films deserve that. They were terrible, they were this and that. And I said, you know, you should weep for this, you know, yeah. not yeah. make a joke about it because the job of the critics from my perspective is to encourage art and in our times make it more excellent uh, and so when you see bad art yes you scold them for it but you don't make fun and discourage the artist right yeah no you, you you scold them and you say Gee, you got to get better you know like this and i think they did understand they there were three of them you know uh, but what I'm saying is that on a larger scale, if you, you know, look at a larger picture, that's what critics do. More often than not, when I read a review, I know more about a critic than I know about the film <laughs> right. that that reviewer that's is uh, reviewing. Yeah. You see? And, and so that bothers me. Yeah. You see? In the theater, too. we had that as well. You know, I was part of the theater, and I could see that change in criticisms as well. But in film, it's just abysmal, you yeah. know, to me. Yeah. Um, the ones I mentioned are the ones... I respect they get you know the big papers, but even there, I notice their reviews are getting shorter and shorter because the paper is giving less space to that kind of thing, you know, and it's a shame. And so, what I'd like to see really is that maybe a website yeah. where critics could come on and do you know what you're saying, right. podcast type things like that, because that would be somewhere where. If you want to look in on it, see what's going on, and would give room for thought. Well, yeah. the industry is changing. The way we yeah. watch movies is changing. Mm -hmm. The way we make them is, you know what I mean? Everything right. is in flux, right? Exactly. And I think that criticism is a part of that. Yeah. Right? And uh, what we see now, what's going on now with, with the shrinking of the reviews and, and papers showing less interest in star critics, something might completely change. On, on YouTube or somewhere mm -hmm. online that, that blows open a new door for film criticism. And I hope it does. So we, we shall see. Any last thoughts? Uh, yeah, make criticism better. <laughs> <laughs> do better. Yeah, do better. Because uh, uh, so I want to read you guys.